All right, fruit lovers, this is Ross. I thought I'd update you guys on three different fruits in today's video that I'm growing here in my backyard orchard in the Philadelphia area. This one here is, we, we should call it the Christmas tree plant or the Christmas tree fruit. This is a, a pomegranate called Salavatsky. Really nice, cold hardy pomegranate. Tastes amazing, actually, that I would highly recommend for anybody in zone sevens or in a colder climate. I am just shocked, by the way, at how profusely this thing is flowering right now. And it's in a lot of shade too. Uh, the tree is quite tall up there at the top, but I've created a bit of an arch. Um, when you go through the door here in the backyard, uh, it's quite beautiful. You walk underneath these peaches, which are, by the way, loaded, this Red Haven peach. And then you've got the uh, pomegranate here, and then you've got figs. This is a Neruciola de Elba fig. And by the way, the tree is just surrounded, surrounded by fig trees on the left side of it. Uh, so really doesn't get, like I said, a ton of light, but there it is, there's so many flowers. The cool thing about pomegranates is that they are self-fertile because they produce male and female flowers, typically on spurs. So you need some older wood I would say two or three year old wood is usually good. Um, I just knock some off because what inevitably happens is that the male flowers are so high in number, uh, a lot of them end up falling off because those obviously don't turn into fruit. So a lot of the flowers you see on the ground have dropped. The way you can determine that if they are a male or female flower is by the base of the flower you'll end up seeing a more pronounced bulbous area down here at the base of the flower. And those are the females um, versus a, a more slender bottom here is the male. Anyway, uh, pomegranate, so easy to grow, very problem free. It did take me a little bit for it to kind of come into its own, but I have to say it's definitely an amazing fruit tree that you should be growing in your backyard orchard. Uh, next up, we're gonna talk about grapes. This is a uh, Centennial grape. Shout out to Lucille at Whitman Farms. She sold me this plant. She actually told me a lot about grapes. I was trying to really do some research and learn about different varieties I should grow because I wanted a, a better variation of flavors and textures and you know just eating experience when it comes to my table grapes. I had always grown Mars and some of the, like things like Himrod is another variety. Uh, I can't remember the other one, but really the only that, that did well, the only thing that did well was Mars and some of the Conquer types, like Everest Seedless I have on the west side of the property. Those are grapes that definitely are more suited to my human environment, very disease resistant. And that's really what you need out of a grapevine if you're gonna grow it here in a humid area like the Philadelphia area or anywhere really along the mid-atlantic you absolutely have to have um, you know varieties that are mildew resistant that can have relatively pristine or good looking leaves throughout the remainder of the season because if these leaves start to get damaged and diseased they're not going to be able to pump all those sugars those carbohydrates that the sun produces through photosynthesis into those fruits and you won't have very good tasting fruits your crop will be kind of small. And so in general, I have found grapes, table grapes, specifically vinifera grapes or labrusca grapes or hybrids of the two really need more sun than I've ever really given them. The muscadine is a different story and that is virtually disease-free, problem-free, pest-free, uh, even bird-free here and it, uh, it really produces a lot of grapes in the shade where I have it against the fence behind a bunch of my apples. And that only gets about four to maybe four hours of direct sunlight every day. But this vine here, the Centennial, has just, it looks spectacular. I mean, it's produced a, a lot of clusters. I bagged the clusters here. That's the other trick for getting good quality fruit here in, uh, in this area that you can basically not have to spray your grapes. So uh, otherwise I would have to spray because of black rot. Black rot infects the leaves, depending on the variety, depending on where your grapes are, 
depending on your climate. And then the rain hits the leaves, drops off, lands on the grape clusters and infects the grape clusters and they mummify, they're inedible. And so the only real way to grow spray free high quality grapes is to bag them. So I bag every cluster before they're actually able to be affected by the black rot. You can see this cluster here. This is just a wax paper bag. We take off the leaf, put the wax paper bag around the stem and then staple it. And you can see in here, there's actually some earwigs crawling around, it's kind of gross. And then there's actually the grapes themselves. Uh, so you can see that grape cluster in the bag. It's pretty cool. Um, and I, what I love about this vine, like I said, I, I think this is quite a nice vine. Lucille obviously knows what she's talking about. This is really a nice, healthy, productive vine. And it also, she told me, has a nice muscat flavor. I was originally gonna go with Marquise and she convinced me to go with this one. It's traveled quite far along this trellis I set up for it. And then it comes over here and actually climbs up the arbor that I built a couple of years ago. Um, so that's what's I think been really what's successful for these vines that are quite young. Right over here I think is uh, Jupiter. Again, it's climbing up the arbor and uh, I have to train the vines now along the top of the arbor but uh yeah it's pretty cool to see how successful they can be with just a little bit more sun because the mars and and other vines i used to have were back here against the fence obviously everything is a lot overgrown than it was when i first planted them but you can see there really is just not a whole lot of sun the mars back there is getting a lot of sun because i've allowed it to expand that way and that's really really helped it you could probably see it there on top of the fence in the distance. Um, so the grapes are, are fantastic. They're doing really well. I'm really happy to see the, the quality of the clusters, the amount of clusters. Uh, I've limited the number of clusters though. I definitely thinned out the vines to about 15, 15 or 20. And then each one of them again is, is bagged. Now the third and final fruit I'm gonna talk about is the persimmon. A lot of you guys love the persimmon videos that I do. It's been a long saga with these trees, but I'll tell you, they, they are really problem free and, and very reliable now. I don't really have a bad year anymore. It's just from this point on, more persimmons than I know what to do with. I'll be happy to talk more about flavors and textures and things like that, but we covered a lot of the main uses for them last year at the end of the season we kind of wrapped up all my thoughts i didn't do a whole lot of persimmon videos last year but i thought i'd just show you for size how big these american persimmons are uh, this is proc and this is celebrity they don't get a whole lot of sun again it's only about four hours of direct sunlight maybe five hours of direct sunlight a day and it's amazing how many fruits they can produce in such a small a uh, small amount of light. Celebrity is definitely the better producer. It's been like that. Uh, but I think Proc is still shaking out this hormonal imbalance problem that some persimmons can go through. And once I figured that out with my Rosianca tree that's been in the ground for many years on the um, north side of the property and west side of the property, it's just producing like crazy. Last year we had close to four or 500 persimmons. Again, Gonna get the same thing out of it this year. It's unbelievably productive. I get more persimmons than I know what to do with. But here's the thing, with these trees, uh, there's two things I wanna mention. First, summer pruning. We have to bring back some of these shoots on these American persimmons especially, or the trees that don't flower, or they don't fruit, excuse me. I've never really had a persimmon that didn't flower. It's always they're just not holding on to the, to the fruits once they're pollinated. And they're definitely pollinated. I don't have a problem here with pollinators. I've never had a problem with that. Usually that's not the issue I've found. Maybe even if I had less pollinators, I don't think that would be the issue. It's just the trees are in this state of hormonal balance. I've learned so much about that with the figs and also with persimmons. And so you can see here on the tree, there are a number of shoots, especially towards the top, are very long and vigorous and lanky, 
you could see, especially where we did winter pruning, um, the trees have responded with a lot of water shoots. And if you don't prune those water shoots or a lot of this vigorous stuff here, um, just go around the tree and even just take off 25% of the growth or maybe even less than that, 10% of the growth on the really vigorous shoots, they're gonna respond after you do that in the summer uh, by leafing out and branching out and putting out these new shoots that uh, next year will actually put out more flowers and your tree will be more full. And the fuller it is and the more flowers it produces, the more chances that you have of having your fruits hold on the tree. It's kind of like playing a numbers game. But generally, you just want the trees to be very full. The, the trees generally prune themselves in the winter time. There's very minimal winter pruning. Now, at some point here at the top, I don't want this tree to get any taller, but I will summer prune some of those shoots up there and that will be it. This tree will basically sort of top out around this height and I'll manage it at, at this size. And, and that's really all I have to watch out for is just doing a little bit of summer pruning here and there. Eventually, you don't really have to do much at all, believe it or not. The tree kind of slows down, eventually fruits more. And because there's all this energy like this celebrity tree that needs all of this fruit here or has all this fruit on it, it doesn't grow nearly as quickly. The size difference between the celebrity and the proc and the vigor is a stark comparison. Somebody did ask me about the um, Sejo trees I have. None of them have held on to their fruits. I'm sorry, none of them have even flowered yet. So that's a bit of a uh, thing there. Actually, yeah, that was, a, I think I misspoke earlier in the video, but yeah, that's the case with the Sejo's trees. And I think they just, unfortunately, this one here, which is quite mature, is not getting enough sunlight. And I think that's really the only reason it's not flowering. And if your persimmon's not flowering, that's probably the case. But if it has these long shoots on it, like this one does because it doesn't have any fruits, I'm gonna come in here and again, do more summer pruning. And the last thing I'll leave you guys with is that there's four or three main uses, I think, for persimmons, at least that I, that I like to use them for. I think you need to have a variety that is early, like proc, that you can eat fresh. To me, the American persimmons are better, when, uh, better fresh, they're soft, they're richer, they're more complex. In my opinion, there's no comparison when eating them fresh. You guys have your own opinion, but regardless, you should have one that ripens early, whichever type you like. Then I think you have something like a Haichia or even a Fuyu type that you save for Hoshigaki. And right around the first frost here, I'll harvest all of those prior to that. And then I dry them for about 20 to 30 days. Around Thanksgiving, I'm eating, starting to eat Hoshigaki. So basically I'm eating proc from the, be the beginning they start and other persimmons like it up until Thanksgiving. Then I start eating Hoshigaki. And then finally the third use, you can have a fresh eating persimmon that's on the trees, even actually into the winter time. And that's what Rosianka does. Last year I was eating some in like January and February. Um, I froze a lot of them as well, but you can definitely get a persimmon like Rosianka or even Tecumseh is another variety that will do that and make it so that you can actually have persimmons and cover your area of harvest, your harvest window or area of eating them, let's say for quite a wide space. So that's the video here, guys. I hope you enjoyed the three fruits we talked about. I would personally not forgo growing either of these fruits. They're incredible in their own right. And um, yeah, thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button, hit that like button. See you guys for the next one. Take care.